maybe even figure it out. I'm going to start this meeting of the uh, Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors. Good evening, everybody. Jim will be here soon, but he delegated us to begin. Begin. Uh, and as usual, we will begin with public comment. And I do see we have some members of the public here, and I think that they may want to me. give some comment. <laughs> um, if you can sure. come to the front. Here, here. You should sit down okay. right there, or you can stand. So, so I'm the president yourself. of the parents group at the middle school. Okay. And your name is? My name is Lene Timponi. Um, and I basically came to talk about the controversy around fundraising that's kind of floating around town today. Um, as the parents group president, we met for a lot of like, several months to plan um, and did our best to find a fundraiser that included local businesses um, and kind of ticked all the boxes for our community. Um, we, you know, we're all just trying to raise money for our middle schoolers. Um, there aren't a lot of um, supportive people in the school. Parents group meetings tend to be five people. Um, so I just wanted to come out and say, you know, that we love input from the community and that we're encouraging more parents to be involved and I tried to answer all of their questions um, that came at me last night and this morning um, so that they could be informed um, and that I just will continue to work really hard for the middle schoolers and I hope that some other parents will join me constructively. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank for you. Coming. Jim has shown up, so I'm just <laughs> <laughs> you'll be sure. But I do thank want to you. say thank you for your work on the parents group thank committee. You. And I feel like I might just want to add, if I can say this, Go just that um, uh, the school board does not react that quickly to things on Facebook. This was yes, on the certainly. agenda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it was on the agenda. I haven't put on the agenda so a few days ago. Uh, yes. And uh, so some school board members may not know that. Yes, um, we saw that. Wasn't. Of course. Awesome. All right, that's, that's me. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? <laughs> uh, yeah. um, great, I'm sorry I'm late. Um, moving to the consent agenda. Um, can I pull something? Yeah, can I motion to pull this? The superintendent's report just to ask. Yeah, that would be a question. But. Make a motion to approve the when we move. Yeah. Approve it with that. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of the superintendent's report. I have a second. I'll second. All the favor? Aye. Aye. You opposed? All yours. Thank you. Um, we don't need to, to address this right now, but I just thought since there was mention of busing in here, and since busing was a big issue last year and a big budget issue, mm -hmm. could we get an update on how, like I said, it's really early right now, but in the, the next month or so, could we get an update on how the busing situation has coalesced and you know, what's working, what's not working, what what the orientation looks like. And I don't know if there's any brief updates now, but. Yeah, I mean, unless you want to speak now, my, my sense is that another two or three weeks might be helpful to really. More helpful. Like right now, maybe maybe coalescing as opposed to coalesce. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that statement, Jim, <laughs> so articulately. <laughs> I can speak to it briefly. I mean, it's a, this busing has been a significant change for our community. Um, and with change comes understanding change. and time and, and bumps to iron out. Um, right now, the, um, the schedule is set. There are some things that were changed because of two reasons. One, because of the addition of MM. Uh, middle school riders, as well as buses being consistently late last year, particularly in the weather, so the bus garage decided to move it forward, move the timing forward a little bit um, to give them more time to get kids to school. 
and um, and that's caused some consternation amongst um, particularly younger kid families, which is understandable. Um, we we gave the bus garage a 45 minute time period that we wanted kids on the bus, and they're doing the best they can to abide by that for across the area. So we have a large area now that we're working with, with the addition of Roxbury to the Bumpkiller buses. Um, so that was quite a feat for them to accomplish, <laughs> and they have. Um, we didn't want kids on the bus that long. Currently, um, I actually have a meeting that was just set tomorrow um, because there is a large challenge as to how to pick up and drop off middle schoolers in a city that does not have a school building built or a parking lot built to drop off and pick up middle schoolers mm -hmm. um, safely to the buses, to the community, to the traffic flow, to all of that. Um, and we did debate lots of different ways to do it. We chose on one and people aren't happy with the way we chose it. So um, I do have a meeting tomorrow with Pam and Aunt Ryan, Stacy from the bus garage, um, uh, the police, police chief, Matt Nisley, Bob Owens, the fire chief. So to, to take in some safety considerations and see if more minds can think of a different idea than we did. Um, I'm not hopeful in that take, but we do have that meeting center. It may tomorrow. be one of the reasons we never bust middle schoolers before. It's definitely something that was not anticipated. The U32 bus drops off near the middle school. Um, and I, I think they pick up and drop off near the middle school. I think they stop in the middle of the roundabout and let kids. We have six buses. So six buses would would fill that roundabout right up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. that would block traffic in several directions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's you know we, we've we've debated all these different ideas. So we're going to get more more of the leaders in the community around the table tomorrow to see if they can think through other ideas that we haven't thought through. Six um, buses. We have six buses. Loading and unloading at the same time. Yeah, yeah, ideally, because that's the fastest. Right. Um, if we were to move up to Main Street and do it right in front, yeah. um, not only do we have lots of experiences from our own vans as well as the bus company that are that things get clipped very quickly um, and accidents happen very quickly because people don't want to wait. Yeah. Um, the red lights would have to be flashing, so you're stopping traffic on Main Street, which is a very busy road, two ways for the pickup and drop off, and the bus only two buses can fit at a time there, so it'd be two buses, load them, move them. Move two more in, load them, move on. I was going to say, to, to line it up, you'd have to have no Yikes. parking forever. Yep. So there is no ideal situation to this, to this problem. Um, so we're going to talk about it tomorrow and see if we can come to a better solution than what we have now. We can rearrange some of the um, timing at the elementary school so the buses get their middle schoolers load right away. You know there's no wait time and see what happens. And, and did we go with two new buses? I know that's what we yes. budgeted, but yeah. we weren't certain. Yeah. I would make the statement, too, um, that everybody is working incredibly hard to make what is a hard situation the best it can possibly be. I would just want to make sure everybody, the bus garage is working very hard. I see Emerson spent her entire day in Montpelier doing our street, our runs on her own in her car today to ensure that she made good decisions and safe decisions. For, like, everybody is working incredibly hard on this. And when you do something do, new, it does take time to yeah. work it out. Yeah. Do we know how many middle schoolers are actually riding the buses? They're pretty full. Of middle schoolers? No, of kids. So of our buses. Do I know exactly how many middle schoolers? No, we don't have that data just yet. But one of the things that we heard during the process of receiving community input was that we were likely to have an increase in elementary school students riding because people who were driving their elementary and middle school students were doing so because of that disparity in time. Mm -hmm. And so... When the middle schooler yeah. can ride, or, so can yeah. the elementary students. Should, yeah. should, if every child on the route took the bus in the morning, in particular, each bus would have between 70 and 80 kids on it, which is a max capacity. That's a lot of kids. Yeah. Right. Wow. <laughs> um, it's max capacity. So that, that creates the challenge in the after school world of parents who want their kids dropped off in different after school locations that if all of those morning riders are also afternoon riders, which we know they're not, mm -hmm. right, because yeah. of other after school activities in part two and extracurriculars and all that kind of stuff, then the primary responsibility of the bus garage, what we've hired them to do is get kids home. Right. Um, so that's the primary responsibility, which is a change, because before there was room, right? So 
we're working on collecting the data in the afternoon to find out just how many kids are on the buses and what is room which ones what? are fuller. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Everybody is working incredibly hard on this. <laughs> sure. So, Jim, before we leave this, I'd like to say, on behalf of the board, I don't think the board will mind me saying this, to thank you for this, to the staff for the opening of school. You talked about it, and I know you thank them, but in a lot of cases, it was not quite what they thought about the couple weeks moving up to school, and I'm very appreciative that it went well, and we have such a wonderful professional yeah. staff that it went well. They were very flexible. Everything got done. <laughs> <laughs> done ish. Mostly. Uh, Mostly. Almost. As Andrew will speak to a bit. Is it about the, the superintendent's report? Huh? Is that something that actually needs to be approved? Superintendent's report? Uh, it's on the agenda to approve, so if so I would I would approve it. Um, I would make the motion to approve it by itself, yeah. Second it. In favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, Andrew, construction review. Talking about construction. Yeah. So, do you want to give an introduction or do you want to? At least, 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 at it's like, always good to re-say who you are yeah. if someone <laughs> hasn't seen you before. Um, more along the lines of summaries and futures and things like that. I got it. So, uh, <laughs> yes, we are speaking to that last couple weeks of thrash, and, and there's still going to be a couple weeks of thrash around here. But absolutely, the custodial staff in particular from my end uh, did an amazing job of working hard and continuing to work hard and uh, at times seeming like they were shoveling sand against the tide, uh, but they kept with it and um, were the buildings in the condition that Tom particularly has set for himself? No, but we were able to address the other more immediate needs and we'll get back up there. Uh, to be quite honest, I think you all have seen as you sit in stoplights with dump trucks and backhoes and all this, there is Arguably, never been a construction season like this that we thought that we faced. And if if you, we had said uh, back in June, the contractor had said to us, "You're just not going to get the materials because they're going to every other construction project in America," it wouldn't have shocked me. Uh, EF Wall did an amazing job um, on the project, making sure that we had had what we need and we had the resources and kept the service engaged and. Um, the, the job super, the on-site job supervisor, which we knew when we signed a contract with them, we knew that we were getting fed. We knew we were in as good hands as we were going to get. And uh, that goes also with the playground project in ECI. Uh, they did a really great job of saying it, keeping on it. It seemed, as we all know, we went by that. It didn't seem like anybody was making any progress. And it's uh, ironic that it's a small project, so the most difficult because you can't put
we designed the there, or have to wait until one of the breaks or next summer to take, or take out the old one. We needed to prioritize and take care of that. Mm -hmm. We'll just leave that and take care of it at a later date. Um, still under our contract, but we'll just we'll just wait until but they have more important things to focus on. Uh, the, the fire alarm system is in place. It is not operating right now. We're operating off of the old system, which is always the plan to always leave your old fire alarm system in place until the other one's tested and proven. We uh, met with the fire chief and then Chris and the building inspector over there, and they're satisfied with the system that we have in place. Let me say it's the one that we have. There was a, they downloaded the brains and it didn't and so they're going to re-download the brains, but, you know, it's somebody who has to come up from Tennessee, and they'll be here in a couple weeks. And once that system is fully tested, we'll swap over onto the new system. Um, there's still a lot of electrical work in the touch-up things, but um, primarily the contractors are out of the, out of the school building. Like I said, there's some work in the basement, and um, they're working with Chris Luce to make sure that they have the access they need and make sure that we don't interact with the teaching of the children. Main Street Mural, uh, we built two game restrooms. That was actually part of the capital fund. We did those as part of the bond work, but we separated out the money, um, which made financial sense to, you know, the, the project gets cheap on square footage, the more you can contract at once. So we have all those as well. Um, they are very similar. If you have had a chance to look at the new restrooms out in the lobby, lots of tile, um, lots of hardwearing surfaces. Um, those projects that have finished up, they're still on the end. Nickel and dime stuff, a mirror here, a, a, a fixture there that needs to be tightened or whatever. But fundamentally, the contract are out of the building over there. Um, the ceilings? Yes, we took advantage of, I don't remember if any of you remember the old ceilings at, the, at Main Street Mill, but we had a good contractor and we said, let's do it. Oh, like throughout? What's that? Throughout the building? Or? We did the first, we did the three in house to the basement last year ourselves. And so this year we did the wings on the first floor that had drop ceilings, and then we did the third floor and put in new lights and put in new suns, and it makes a world of difference. I mean, it's just... It's a lot brighter. It's brighter, and it's not broken and twisted and yellowed, and, you know, it, it's crisp. It's crisp. Yeah, it's crisp. It's it's drop ceiling? What's that? Is it still drop, drop ceiling? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, it was pretty dingy and nasty. Yeah, yeah, it was... I'm, I'm so pleased with that. I'm so pleased with that. But that was kind of the scope at the Main Street Mills. And uh, again, safety doors too. Yeah, the other thing part of the safety game, we were able to create that uh, entry vestibule. Uh, we're still, the doors again were, were made over and buried um, by John Rose, who's a woodworker over there. And uh, they match the rest of the Main Street, do. which look really nice. They do. And we've had the, the key fob system now that you can basically go into this lock vestibule and then get buzzed into the into the building after that. Again, there's still some little bit of wiring to do and all that, but um, it's, the pieces are in place. Was there any outdoor work at Main There Street? was. There was. We took down the shrubs in front of the building. And uh, fortunately, there's lots of trees in front of the building, so you can't really tell, but we, we got rid of those for a couple of reasons. We got rid of them because they, were, they weren't all that attractive. They were hiding in the building. Um, and it's not great to have trees right up against your building, you know, traps moisture and things of that nature. So um, if there's a tree down front right there, the building would really pop. But it's still an improvement, I believe it's an improvement. Um, we also took down a lot of the, when we did the UBS, we took down a lot of the trees in front of the UBS to let that building stand out and go back to its former glory. Um, Speaking of trees, no trees take a lot of water, so we have a system to keep these trees alive. We do. There is, as part of our, as part of our uh, business maintenance portion of it, there's a 90-day maintenance as well as a year warranty on all plantings. 
that we have as part of the UES project. And I, I think last time you were here, you mentioned uh, new signs for the buildings. I think that's something we definitely look into. Um, the sign in UES is old and starting to rot. Yeah. There is no sign at Main Street Middle, and we've got that sort of so roller thing. thing. Pull up our 
they stayed on top of them. It's a dusty business. It's a dusty business. And uh, there's, there's no way around it. There's no way around it. essentially the on-site engineer for the, everything that was bonded. Contractor. And on-site contractor for everything that was bonded. Yes. Oh, the playground. ECI was the playground. So our black room is the architects for the building projects, and SE Group uh, out of Burlington mm -hmm. was the playground. So EFWA was the lead at Union on the inside course, but it would have been SE group on the outside. Correct. ECI on the outside. ECI. And it was great. It was great having them available. And we, we, so every year we put together our, our budgets and the projects that we have every year that we want to do. And to have the well available to us to say, hey, we were talking about doing the ceilings, get us a price. And they were able to oversee that, so we were actually able to sort of get that work contracted for not for free, but the coordination was for free almost because they were here doing it. Well as you said in a small space with all those contractors coming and going. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a hard that there were painters standing on the shoulders of the and you know holding up the It didn't make me crazy. But <laughs> Wait, you know, say it didn't I, I did it did make oh, so you said
they they didn't they weren't they kept us in track. But I also learned that they weren't going to lead us down. They weren't going to say, well last week we can't do it. You know, they just said three to four weeks out. We're just not, you know, it's just not going to fall in place. But um on here that for this conversation can we ask
the Latin press will really start to make great improvements. Um, but the, the foundation is there for sure. You know, we've got some of that heavy lifting out of the way, so we're really going to be able to see results um, since the infrastructure is in here. But that is it. We can see the job of learning the teachers, just like the students, at the first time of the year, saying to them, it's going to be a in June. And nobody's going to want to do it. But part of what we need, is, need to do is that, that will, when the teachers come back and the custodial staff is trying to get things back together, and this was a really bad year, um, that maybe we can have some of that work done early in the season, earlier in the season. And that's a lot to ask of the faculty at the end of the year. Last thing in the world they're doing is thinking about the start of the next school year. But if you can get early to jump on things, not really really.
nurses had before we negotiated last year um, because they have additional requirements in order to keep their license that are very similar to the, um, the teacher. Gosh, I'm delighted. and then um, if the board wants to develop a policy, we could go in that direction and then people wouldn't be guessing about mm -hmm. what makes sense and doesn't make sense. Yeah. But the you know, board might not feel that way, but I thought it was worth raising. Well, we did start this conversation at one of the earlier right. meetings this summer talking about the Montreal trip and the Boston trip and kids fundraising for those trips and kids not really understanding why they're fundraising for those trips versus fundraising for parents group versus miscellaneous fund, you know, other fundraising. And maybe it would be worth looking at having the board create a budget for field trips that includes, you know, a certain number of big field trips that we know are happening to make sure that everybody gets to go and um, nobody has to go door to door to go. And then, and then be clear about what's additional. Uh, right. uh, how those additional things are handled, too. I mean, I mean we don't want to be approving every field trip either. When, when I first came on the board, we did have 
to approve a you know field trips it, under certain circumstances, and it was really unclear as to the basis for that or well, well, we chose that there. extra thing becomes either there's a lot of pressure directly or indirectly to participate in some of the fundraising for you know the extra activities where that pressure should not exist. And I don't always do this, I have to say, but since since I've been interested in the issue, I think I read most of the discussion on one of the social media pieces around this particular fundraiser that started yesterday and a lot of people were raising questions about the cost of the Montreal trip and the cost of the Boston trip mm -hmm. at the middle school and how do those get paid for um, if families can't afford them and I, I actually even though my kids been on those trips I'm not entirely sure that I understand the mechanisms that are in place to make sure that uh, that's, that's what I was going to ask yeah. you asked at the beginning I'd like a sort of a recap of who determines what the money for boosters goes to at the high school or who determines if they raise money at the middle school what happens to that do we have any sort of a could we have an explanation of that so you're asking about two different things. Okay. One, right, so parents groups at the middle school typically, and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> will, uh, teachers will make a request for money from parents groups at the middle school or elementary school or here at the high school um, for things outside the box. So it could be author's visits. Um, I was just in the office yesterday at UBS and they were talking about a musician um, and asking the parents group to pay for a rotating or a musician educator to come in. Um, so, you know, that kind of piece. The, the sports fundraising, I asked Matt Link about this today because I assumed, Tina, once you would ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> not typical. So put that aside from your thinking. Um, but like when the soccer team, for instance, does fundraising, the school budget pays for their uniforms and transportation and that kind of thing. But if the whole team wants a rain normal outfit that has you know, killer so like that's something that the kids are going to keep that has their name on it, you know, it's something additional to what we provide the team, then the funder is for that. Right? They're going to keep that. It's not going to stay in the coffers of the school, Montpelier High School. The kids are going to keep that. Um, sometimes with the boosters, if they pay for something that's additional, like let's say we want our fall sports teams to have rain gear. Um, without their names on it. Without their names on it, just as Montpelier High School soccer, then if the boosters pay for it, then that does become the high school's possession and kids use them every year. Um, is my understanding of the process. So it's a different it's a different piece of the puzzle for why different people fundraise. So those are two, but then if a sixth grade class wants to go to Montreal, the sixth grade class raises money. Is that not correct? The PTA does not give it to them. Well, often what happens is the kids in the class will fundraise. So let's say the sixth grade class wants to go and it costs $5,000. Right. Maybe the kids go door to door. They manage to come up with $500, then they put in an application to the parents group and they say, can we have another $500? And the parents group gives them that. And then they have to pay $50 or something. Right. Yeah. And then what happens if a parent, if a family can't afford whatever the remaining bill is? Which oh. our last year's Montreal trip, I think, was $600. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that's where the board's conversation around equity fits in. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where it is because what we don't want to create is a charity situation, which is what we have now. Right. Basically, if the family can't afford it, then they ask for financial assistance, and it's up to the family to ask that, and that puts vulnerable families in a hard spot. So, um, so that's what connects to our equity discussion that we had in this right? January. Yeah, yeah. Um, last year around does the board when we think of budgeting this year, want to make a blanket field trip travel fund and say we will fund these trips 
the question will become, which trips are you going to fund and which ones aren't you going to fund? Yeah, I'm curious, how does this all fit in with our curriculum planning? So if at the beginning of the school year, all the classes decide they want to do these trips and they fundraise for it, do they just have it? Or do we as the administration, do they choose these are the primary trips that will benefit our students the most in these ages with these experiences and these are the ones the district supports and um, I think you get different answers if you ask different panel. So I think teachers would say their curriculum focus. We've never had a curriculum formalized, so it would be a hard sell for me to answer that way. I would answer it as it's tradition. It, the, it's they go to Montreal, they go to Boston, they go to, and we're not unique in that, but I'd say it's, it's tradition, it's where you go. Now you might say, because I remember the beginning, uh, they went to Montreal because we said it can't because they we said they they do that now? I don't think so. It's, it's a foreign language trip. It's the foreign language trip. They go there for. I'm just telling you what happened 20 years ago. We went to Montreal because social studies was Canada for sixth grade. Now, as you well know, I come from a curriculum background, and there's no standard that's labeled Canada. Uh, <laughs> I absolutely know that. I'm just telling you where that discussion came from. So, from, from an equity perspective, though, providing the same exact. Um, level of support to um, the economically advantaged and the economically disadvantaged um, without a um, equitable, super equitable revenue source. I don't know if it really accomplishes our goal of equitability, yeah. but I am very, you know, sensitive to the whole concept of, you know, the, the st stigmatizing the process. Mm -hmm. Making it free. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Andrew, he's saying if you give money to people who don't need it, that's not the same as equity. Yes. If you, if you, if you provide the same compensation to someone who has an income of a household income of $300,000 versus a household of $30,000, I don't see how that improves the equitability of the situation. But that's all about education. Right. What I don't know about it exactly. this is that this is public education. Mm -hmm. And we do not care what your income is when we give you a, an English text or a social studies text. Yeah. We give it to you to use. And because it's probably a public tool that we have decided to get this. And I would say, to, to, to Libby's, I would say, I would certainly like the discussion of, okay, I think we should have X number of field trips during from K to 12 during the course of the year, and you can decide. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, we might say, no, 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 it's scary, because it's not going to be current to our decision. I was right, and that's what I would say. <laughs> it needs to relate to the curriculum, which we might now have. So, you know, that would be my And we think it's important for kids to have the experience of, look, we have Boston, it's a great historic resource, not that far away. We, I know we don't, I've heard we don't have the curriculum. No, but we have colonial history. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's definitely a and, uh, trip. I know we, I've heard that we don't take kids to the ocean anymore. I think that's a shame. I think we should take them to the ocean. Um, which could be part of a science. I have not heard that one. So. Science related. We used to take third graders to the ocean. <laughs> yeah, I think they what go to the gorge now. Well, there's an interesting. Who does right now? Who does approve a field trip? They come principals. to principals. the principals. I, I, don't too. Get, yeah. I don't get. Okay. I don't get. Approval for so it's the principals in each building would decide on who mm -hmm. goes where. Okay. And it is is to be honest, I can speak from when I took kids to, to Montreal, and not only was it taking the children out of the country and out of this city, neither of which some of them had been, but the parents that attended with us, some of them had never been out of the city nor out of the country. So all part of the education. I feel like there's at least three different threads in this conversation, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So one is if there's gonna be fundraising that's endorsed by the district, what kind of fundraising would, would I think a policy system board would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the topic of if we're going to have field trips, are they going to be curricular and subject to some kind of a uh, approval that they are connected to the curriculum or not? 
And then there's the question of if we're going to have field trips, are they going to be funded? Through the budget, the district through the budget without more time for fundraising. So, so I, I just wanted to say that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hearing all three of them going on, and they're, they're actually yeah. three different topics, all important. And there's also, I mean, there's also a field trip to Echo in Burlington, let's yeah. say, which is a bus for a cost. Yeah. You know? Right. And then there's a field trip. <laughs> it's an overnight. Right. Trip. Right. So, 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 very so, different so, things. Yeah, if you took a grade at, you know, 60 bucks, 600 dollars yeah. ahead to Montreal, most of a grade, it's like 40 to 50 thousand dollars. Yeah, you're, you're I mean, that's the only time. time. Is that the only time that happens, K to 12, mm -hmm. that a whole class goes away overnight? For, mm -hmm. I think it is. That's the only time in Montreal. Mm -hmm. How do they stay overnight in Montreal? Well, I mean, you know, I mean yeah. <sighs> do we you know, throw the needle on the charity in a different way where? give subsidies to certain families regardless of whether they ask. For instance, you know, kids that qualify for free and reduced mm -hmm. lunch. That would be an easy way, but um, I don't know how, I don't know. There are some circumstances where. I don't know whether people just above that limit are have any easier time. But mm -hmm. I don't know how, I don't know what it feels like to be that close to that limit. So. I, I don't know what the answer is to this. I'm not suggesting that I do right now. I think it's. We, we need a bit more information, um, but just to say that public because it's public education, well, that is equity throughout this pool of resources. We know that public education isn't always equitable, and we're striving to create a more equitable system. Yeah, that's true. So that's kind of the lens that I'm raising this yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I think that's, that's a tough question to ask. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, and then the question is if we if we take out the full cost of all the things, or most of the things that are fundraised for, um, are we willing to do that? All of the things that they run, they were fundraised for, are not things that need to be done through the public schools. Well, I mean, the the that the the things that are like really great experiences that are are still very valuable, but not necessarily um, you know, in the food, water, shelter category. I think I, I think I, I think it gets tough. The, the parents group I know don't find the same thing. I'm speaking just from my experience as a building administrator and teacher yeah. for many years, not necessarily as a superintendent right now, because I, again, I don't approve these requests in my position. But um, a parents group may pay for th different things each year, right? Because opportunities mm -hmm. arise. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're not necessarily set. And I also worry about getting kids out of a building, particularly those from lower socioeconomic status families and kids who come speaking a different language than English. And, and yeah, right, mm -hmm. getting them out of the building, the language development that things like a field trip does for yeah. kids is tremendous. Um, and experiences are tremendous. So um, it's a conundrum, and I don't, I don't, I don't know really well in the position, but I don't want to limit those opportunities for teachers to think about it. It's good to hear from you that you think there's great value yeah. in it. Oh, absolutely. Do I think it has to go on a trip? No, they don't want me to go on a trip, but I think the I think having a, having some something where a first grade teacher can say, hey, there's this show at the Flynn that's connected to the reading meeting I just did and the reading lab I just did, and they're doing Matilda on stage. I want to take my kids to it. Like they don't know that's going to happen mm -hmm. a year in advance, right? So. Yeah. Well, another consideration too is that I think it's kind of to your point. Yeah, a trip back to Boston or a trip back to Montreal. You know, the, the families that can afford that. You know, they're going to Boston, Montreal. All those kids have yeah. those experiences through family trips, and you know, if it's a well, that's not really necessary for curriculum, or we don't need that. You know. In the classroom, that can open eyes, that can broaden horizons, increase uh, independence, increase independence, okay. and a lot of the students, you know, for some students, that's that's their opportunity to go see Montreal or go see Boston and have, um, you know, have their eyes open to you know that experience. Uh, the difficulty I have, and probably back to what Andrew had to say about what you just said too, is. 
um, making the determination about whether I can afford the trip or not is probably not equitable. It, and maybe you could say something like free and reduced lunch, but suppose I'm just about free and reduced lunch and actually I can't afford in my budget to pay that amount of money to go to Montreal. And by the way, broker. Right, my car just broke or something happened. And by the way, I'm not going to ask you, nor am I going to tell you. Because I've always been able to pay for myself. I would add on to it, Tina, too. And now, now I take off my administrative yeah, yeah, okay. hat. My, my personal sixth grader class is going to a camp, like a summer camp, but they do school things, right? It's not a choice. It's not a choice for us as parents. Right. And so we're getting a $263 bill for that. Now, my choices were I will work to fundraise and try to decrease my cost. Mm -hmm. I will ask for financial aid, or I will pay the full boat. You all keep me very busy as a superintendent. Mm -hmm. You all keep me very busy as a superintendent. <laughs> so my box was checked with $263 grumbling, which I can afford. And I want my son to have that experience. But at the same time, I was like, this is not a choice for me. Right? So there's lots of different ways to look at it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Could I also add just one thing from a completely different perspective? Um, isn't it also a good experience for kids to do the fundraising, to learn? to be independent, to learn kind of the value of a dollar, and to have that kind of ownership. Like, I paid for this, I helped create this trip. And I, I do agree with, you know, maybe there needs to be a policy about what that looks like, but I think it is a valuable experience for them. That's something Matt Link spoke about mm -hmm. today. Like, if the soccer team wants to get their name on a something, Right, that they have to go out and they have to ask for it. They have to mm -hmm. learn how to speak yeah. to strangers and politely yeah. and responsibly. Yeah. 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 As the devil's advocate, I'd say. However, if you are the parent, if I'm selling chocolate bars, and you're the parent that can take three boxes to the office with you and sell them in one day, and I, by the way, don't work at a business that I could take any of those boxes and sell them at. The children gain different things from that. That's I'm just telling you what does happen. And I would the other point I would add about the time that fundraising might take from the staff. I mean, it, yeah, the staff and in the school day. But if you think about the return on investment, and we have teachers and faculty that are well trained and that we're paying very as we're paying to teach, and if they're taking time out of their day to do, to work on anything that's coordinating around the fundraising, like Matt is, you know, for their athletics, it may be that it really makes no financial sense. And, the, it, you know, a, a profession, an organization that was um, a nonprofit that's doing fundraising to stay afloat would always be counting any staff time and the cost of that staff time to figure out, you know, to the extent that a fundraising effort makes any sense financially, they'd be counting how much they're paying their staff to work on it, um, and I don't think that we do that, and I realize that a lot of the work is done by parents, but I, I do get the sense that teachers and can get drawn into it, or you know, Matt seems to be drawn into this, mm -hmm. Coach, soccer coaches seem to be drawn into it. I'm not sure that the district ever sort of sits back and looked at My recollection from the fifth grade Boston trip was that the teachers spent a lot of time on fundraising activity, and I was enough that I was starting to be like, this doesn't make any financial mm -hmm. sense to me at all that the teachers are, are doing that. Um, also, sometimes classroom time. I'm checking off who's given me right. what, when, at the right. beginning of the day. Right. So I think that's definitely a consideration that the district should be keeping in mind. Well, I would support um, Jerry's comment, though, that I mean, I sold a lot of hoagies growing up, <laughs> an Italian sub, and in Pennsylvania, it's a of hoagies in my youth. And I think it was really, really helpful. I'm a really, really shy person. And it was really helpful for me to have that experience of asking people for, to buy hoagies. And the baseball team was at Shaw's all weekend. And that's crazy. Yeah. They were at Shaw's selling, selling to go on their spring break trip. Right. And I think that's where the district can, you know, as, as I was saying to Jim in a meeting we had, the district can use the help and support and guidance of the school board. And because 
is that trip in particular, right? There's been lots of requests to do fundraisers on campus and and on, right. um, and we've done a lot so far this year to do outside like big sales. Other organizations to come do fundraisers on our campus here. Mm -hmm. And I was able to say, because I knew you all wanted to talk about it, we're putting a hold on um, any additional fundraisers because the board what are you talking yeah. about? Okay. So like the baseball team wanted to do a flamingo fundraiser thing and put flamingos all over the lawn one morning and have the baseball team talk to it. You know, like so oh, okay. it was, it's kind of an outside thing. We're not sending them on that trip. They've decided to go on that trip, right? Um, but um, they're a sports team. It's not a it's not the league. It's a right. it is, it's not the school did not decide on going on that trip. The parents of the baseball players decided to go oh, on that trip. trip. Um, so, and then we had, you know, some other, you know, good organizations, cancer organizations, and, uh, you know, like, that was the same policy about outside groups. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm missing that yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure that that's in our policy. Oh, let's see. Oh, then I missed it. I looked for it, and I missed it. You have to point that out to me. I will look for it. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully it made it into the new district policy, but yes. that issue has come up in the past. Okay. The, there's definitely a concern about not having outside groups. That is good to know because I missed that. Yeah. So I've identified a few issues. There seems to be some parameters around when fundraising is appropriate and not appropriate. And then if it is appropriate, what to do about you know, how it's used and situations around equity, you know, particularly for field trips. Um. Maybe there's a money issue. I mean, a bigger field trip falls into the category different than if I want to go to the Flynn yeah. program. It's a different price tag than if I want to go to Montreal for three days. Yeah, I think it's important when is an appropriate time for a fundraiser and when is not. And is the district going to take up any level of that in yes. the budget? Exactly, and that gets to the equity issue. Well, could we put a limit, like, there's no field trip that any family is going to have to pay more than $50 for, kind of a thing? I mean, but I think we would have to understand what the... And I think we're we signing up for it. Yeah, I think we have to understand that, yeah. Yeah. that because um, as, as soon as you say everybody gets this field trip for $50, yeah. everybody's going to take that field trip for $50. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe could we support that in the budget? Yeah. Uh, I, right. We would need to know what the price tag is. Right. You think that's fifty thousand? I mean, it's five hundred dollars per family. I think it's more than time. Some of it's it's like six hundred a class of about eighty students. Mm -hmm. No, that's including the fundraising. But oh, if it was yeah. six hundred times ninety kids, fifty-four thousand dollars. <laughs> Like $1,500? No, the only high school trip is outside. to Ireland, and it costs a jillion dollars, but that is very voluntary and very small. It's like 10 kids, every, 10 kids every two years. So, so I want to clarify, when I was talking about, when I took kids to Montreal, we took them for the day and yeah. brought them home. Yep. Right. <laughs> that was a different fee. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is three days, two Can nights. Have? Yes. Process and they go to Quebec, they go to Quebec City and Montreal. It's your discretion, but I didn't know if you wanted to allow any more comment. I was giving thought to that. Um, what is the board thing? Sure. I'm happy to open it up. I, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so now we can talk about the beginning, including items, but since we have a question, then um, let me get thoughts, and then we should probably make some decisions about. I think I think we're heading towards giving the policy committee so a task. But um, a lot of people, well, a lot of people want to talk. We're assuming you want to talk on this issue. Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you might want to do another issue. A little bit. So we have four that I'm seeing. That's what I'm seeing. Maybe five or something. Joe. Five. Six. Sorry, I don't know your name. Chris. Um, Lene. Lene. I, I <laughs> should have known that. So it's next. Why well, don't try to keep it to a minute each? 
minutes or two minutes. Being concise. <laughs> you don't need this, Joe. <laughs> um, please introduce yourself for the. <laughs> Hello, my name is Adrian Gill, and hopefully I will help solve some of your conversations that you had tonight. I'm the president of the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools Partners in Education, um, MRPS High, which is a newly formed parents group that is an umbrella organization that oversees all four parents groups, so Roxbury U.S., Main Street Middle School, and High School. Um, we were one of our 501c3 this winter, and so we have been working very, very hard to build our operations, our financial policy, our board um, over the past six months. And looking forward, really the vision of this, or this organization has been decades of exactly what we're talking about here today, is to help resolve some of these pain points. And so we want to create order, we want to create a system, we want to create transparency around all the fundraising that happens in our school district. And in order to do that, um, really the first step that the board is going to be working on over the next couple of months is taking an inventory of what are our fundraisers. Who is fundraising? How much are they asking? Why are they asking? And when are they asking for this money? Um, I'm hoping to reveal some themes, if we can pull some historical data and get a, a really good number to share with the, the board about what is the actual number that we're talking about here, because we can't just keep throwing darts at the wall. We have to have actual data before we make some informed decisions. And so we are in the process. We started that spreadsheet. We have some good data, but it is not done yet. We still have to do a lot of digging because, as you said, fundraisers pop up out of nowhere. And it would be really nice to be proactive in our fundraising. And, you know, there might be outliers here and there, but really to limit that and plan for the year ahead if we can. Um, I don't know what the number is. Our goal is to, as I said, produce that and then really create the financial policies that we have transparency, we have our own policies around fundraising, um, we're coordinating and communicating around all of the schools. One thing that just bothered me was our customers. So say for National Life, our parents, they're our customers. They're getting bombarded with fundraisers. Mm -hmm. There has to be a more streamlined, effective way so that our customers are not getting confused about why are you keep asking me for money. And so this is going to take time. Um, we're really in the infant stage of building an organization. As you know, that's a pretty big, a tall order in, um, you know, making that happen. But I feel that the board that we have is, is great. Everyone is energized. There's representation from all the schools. And if you give us time to come back in the winter and share our updated information with you and have some good numbers and maybe some um, structure, I think that will help inform a fundraising policy that you will feel really good about based on some data that we can produce for you. Based on data. Data is great. I'm guessing you'd be happy to work with the policy committee on. I mean, this is exciting. I think we have a huge opportunity. We have the right people at the table, and I think we can get this done. So, since you've begun this, what is your timeline? I mean, so we, so I said we received our designation of the 501c3 in the winter, and since then we have been really trying to restructure our financial policy. So every, every school has their own bank. Mm -hmm. And so we've merged all the schools under one bank account so that we can see all the accounting. Um, we're trying to build structure for receipts because once you're a 501c3, there's fiscal responsibility that you have to maintain. Mm -hmm. And so that's just taking a long time to kind of move the Titanic around all four parents groups to come under one umbrella. And, you know, I think we're still in the infant phase of communication and awareness. I mean, there's been a lot of behind-the-scenes work that's been done. Um, I don't think people are really aware of what we're doing um, because we weren't ready to come out. Yeah. <laughs> it's what we're, doing. we're trying to be very strategic and thoughtful of how we build this and do it right. Um, and so that's what we focus on. We're focusing on the board. We have a board policy. We have bylaws. 
so that just takes time to build, and that's pretty much all we've been doing for the past six months. Great. And will you be at this another six months before you'd like to talk to us again, or what's the... So actually, we have started the data. We have a pretty good outline, and it's not close to our share of anyone outside of our board. But I asked the board to start thinking about how we're going to collect more of this information in our parents' groups, maybe we can assign people to help us. It's going to take a huge team effort to collect this data. And so I said by the end of October, I did get a little bit of pushback, but I'm thinking probably realistically January, February, just because people are busy in life. So. It's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, Adrian, just to clarify for the community at large, this is now essentially a, a tax deductible donation, yes. sort of a foundation that's not associated with the yes. school. It is associated with the school. So, if you, we built a website, and the website is mrpspi.org, and attached there is all the four parents groups website, so you can make a tax, what is it, a tax, tax deductible, tax deductible donation to any four schools, right. and pi and all those. Yeah. 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 The finances are separate from the school. has been tricky. So to have it stand alone it is stand alone. Anyone can contribute to to support the school. Yes. And it's hundred percent I mean we all of us are volunteers. Right. We're not paying this house is out we don't have the overhead. So all the donations are hundred percent go right back to the schools and it's a tax deductible donation. Yeah. Great. So we go back to the schools as a donation from the organization. That's part of our financial policy that we are working on. Uh, She's fabulous. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> uh, 
that, that it is, it is, they make it as accessible as they can for people to go and have this amazing experience and you do have to sort of earn it and, and work for it. I think that's incredibly important. I love what the baseball team has done this year. They have taken upon themselves to go above and beyond. To your point about raising, having that spirit of, of, of sort of entrepreneurship and, and working on it, I think that's what Crafter's Edge is all about. And I think that's a great experience. And they get something super fun that's outside of the curriculum base as a reward for that work. Um, and so I think that's there. I think some of it's lost when they're selling plastic knickknacks that nobody really wants. They just want to support their school. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.
So, um, so I was really uh, upset when my daughter came home yesterday and said, and slapped this package on our table and said, Mommy, I have to go out, I have to sell these cards, and I have to, I have to hand it to people, and then they'll feel bad, and they'll feel like they have to buy it, so then they, they won't want to hand it back, so they'll buy it, and it's $20 a piece, and I, and I was like, wait, 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 who, what? Because it didn't sound like what MRPS Pi was working on, it didn't sound like the Boston trip, it, it just sort of came out of nowhere. And then, um, and she said that they had a school-wide assembly to learn about how to do that. And again, my reaction is really emotional to this because um, I feel like any time we uh, put kids in a position where they feel like they have to come up with the money, that means their parents have to come up with the money. And I grew up in St. Johnsbury, which is um, rural and poor. And I remember dreading the Scholastic Book Fair because it was like this wealth of things that we would never be able to have. And I was really glad when I worked at Union, I worked at the book fair, that there was a method that the teachers could help and the parents could help and we could make sure, I think parents group put money in so kids who couldn't, who didn't have money could buy books. So um, I don't think we really understand the message that kids get when they're asked to do that kind of fundraising. I think there's different kinds of fundraising that can be really positive and involved, that involve some sort of community event. Um, and then there's fundraising like what Natalie came home with, um, which to me, obviously, it's really raw. And so therefore, obviously, the me at her age found it really raw. Um, because if I was to get like the thing that I got last year for Boston that said, you can either fundraise, or you can pay in installments, or you can pay. But either way, this is what it's going to cost to do Boston. And asking a kid to fundraise means either asking their parents to fundraise or asking the kids to go out. So I'm all about fundraising. My daughter worked at the 50-50 raffle several times in Mountaineers games to raise money for her softball jersey. Like, I get that. But um, it just felt like such an um, unhealthy delivery of the message to her. And I don't think we really understand. I'm so glad you folks were talking about equity. Because even $50 is a lot for some people and can be prohibitive. And there were definitely kids in Natalie's class who didn't get to go on the fifth grade field trip, and I kind of wondered why. Um, so I really appreciate that you're talking about equity and about ensuring that things that are valuable, like Boston, which frankly, I think she knows more about that period of history than I do because of that trip, yeah. are part of the curriculum. Um, and then we can talk about other ways to fundraise, but um, those are, I think, the big things I wanted to see. So thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I wanted to apologize to Lene for the fact that I posted this on Facebook last night, and she had to definitely and professionally and calmly deflect a lot of other not necessarily helpful commentary that came out of my post about that Show up. Um, we love everyone's opinion, but when we're alone, 
but we can only do our best. So. Than, than a, a thread, especially 
that's an angry one. Right. Uh, <laughs> I say that I learned from Facebook, but I really learned that from when okay. she posted that okay. on the Facebook page. Uh, and I you know, absolutely agree that it's not the best way to meet somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty terrible way to meet somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
and we don't really go to China Star because you can't really eat Chinese food. And my mom said I wasn't allowed to do it. Then she went on Facebook, she posted a whole bunch of things. And uh, tell your mom to call me next time, okay? <laughs> that's underway right now that people are not happy with is generally speaking not our business. Do we want to engage with that at all or do we want to leave it to Libby to work out clarifying what's going on with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And really there's definitely a lot of, I think, stuff swirling around the community in terms of whether kids were being told they had to do it, or sports teams were being told they had to do it, and I think that the school should be clarifying that, I think. I mean, this, it, it, this is definitely management territory. Right. It's right. 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 territory. Yeah. And, and okay. well, it's a tricky one to get out of since we're in the middle of it now. Right. I, it's actually uh, yeah. really Are you still open to people understand what's going to happen. I think what happened matters though. I, I'm still not clear on if kids were told you have to do this thing or you don't have to do this thing. Talk, or school. But when I can speak to them. Yeah. Oh, cool. I'll be here. <laughs> Nobody wants to be here all night. Uh -uh. My kids think it's great because it's past bedtime. Um, so I was there. Um, I actually introduced the fundraiser um, that he was there to speak to kids. Um, I told the kids a really quick short about what we fund. Um, you know, your photo booth for the school dance. You know, we pitch it on your field trips. 
This is what we are trying to help raise money for, so that we can fund all these things for you this year. Yeah. Um, Bob came up. In terms of things they had to say, the only thing he really pressed was, make sure you thank people for their time. They won't remember what you were selling them, but they'll remember the way you treated them. That's what he pressed. So the, you have to sell it, the, you're going to be in trouble if you come back without them, the, you'll be financially responsible if you lose them, all of that came out of nothingness. We are all baffled as to where that, that came from. Like middle school kids talking to middle school kids, I would guess. Um, I had teachers come up to me afterwards who were like, that was really good. Like, he was a good speaker, the kids were really like, solid and like none of us were, you know, shock and awe, horrified at what he had said. Um, I was equally as surprised to see the comments about kids feeling like they had to do something um, that was never conveyed to them. He said, you know, he did, he did express that, or Pam did express that, you know, this is the only fundraiser we're going to hand you this year, the only one. We'd really love for you guys to support your school community because the parents group can't fund your things if they don't have funds to fund them. Um, but the the force that's being expressed behind things just didn't exist. It, I, I called Pam, I emailed Pam this morning and was like, about it all, because I we both were there and we, we couldn't figure it out. So that's, that's what happened. But I, I think I still remain concerned that there's a perception. There are, there are mistaken perceptions. Yeah, there are totally mistaken perceptions. It's not an It's a word that we're out. And it really needs to be addressed both with the athletic teams. And yeah. I know personally that some of the um, athletes on the high school athletic teams got a particular message, um, which I think is not necessarily the district's message. And I think that that message is out there. So I agree it's not management territory, but I do think it's important. Well, I think we should get a little bit to figure out how that is. things that they experience and know about and that this thing is related to that and that 
you may as well have told them. So I I very strong message to send. No, I, I 100% get it. And, and we are very compliant good kids, too. Yeah. Please. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I think it's, it's clear this was, you know, there was good, there were good intentions. The road to hell is paid with good intentions. Uh, this, this is clearly done by experience. Um, yeah, the stage made, and I, I think the lack of clear guidance on how the school interacts with fundraising was here. I mean, there's, you know, school two years and there was a disaster. Yeah. I can also so, make a statement. It's just, it's really bothering me, so I feel like I, and I could get knocked off for this and I recognize it, that there are families who don't have the same value around stores like McDonald's that go to McDonald's because that's the store they can that's afford on a, on a night when they need to have a cheap, a cheap easy meal. Yeah. Um, and so the, the comments, the comments about the bigger box stores or things that Montpelier doesn't value, There's, there are families in Montpelier, I know, who do value those types of opportunities for their family and see it as a night out. Um, so I, I, I want us to watch our, just as we're thinking about equity in our lenses, that we all come with a very big level of privilege, privilege around this table, mm -hmm. and uh, we, have to, we have to keep that in mind. Yeah, but even using my privileged spending resources on the app, I was not generating much revenue for Montpelier Public Schools. Yes, I would rather just write a fifty-dollar check to the parents group and not get a um, coupon. But mm -hmm. we love one. We did outside. We did look into the coupon books of past years that we had used that were local um, after they failed miserably last two years ago. Um, we had pre-bought them all and ended up with, you probably could have built things out of extra coupon books. Okay. Um, so it was a net loss. And um, we surveyed parents and said, what can we do differently? You know, And they said, something that's reusable, something that's not a coupon book. The app with the coupon book had been a disaster and had, um, had parents, um, what was it, like renew their membership and they assumed the money would go back to the school when in fact 
fact, that wasn't the case. And so we did we look for something outside, and schools surrounding us had used this fundraiser with this specific person um, and with great success. I was just going to say it must be the area because at my door today was a U32 player <laughs> trying to sell me a hat. Fundraising policy um, it doesn't seem like the fundraising policy is the right place to address this question of how um, field trips connect with curriculum and are accessible to everybody. That no, seems that's like a different, 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 it's a different conversation. conversation. Important conversation, but it's yeah. definitely a different one. Yeah, it may be addressed in it's a budget conversation. Curriculum budget and the equity policy. I was going to say the equity policy might be mm -hmm. a good spot for that. Yeah. Can the policy committee, um, I know we have a motion, but, but just before I vote on that motion, I just want to understand what that includes. So if it doesn't include that, can we charge them with a, another task? The policy committee, if anybody really wants to know who the heroes in town are. <laughs> charge them with finding where in our existing policy we address the connection between field trips, curriculum, and equity? Just, I'm really interested in that question. So yeah, I'm yeah. happy to do that. Ryan and I tried today and couldn't find anything that I'd like to do. <laughs> Figure out how to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if we need a separate motion, maybe just a more general motion to address the conversation that was before the board tonight. Um, yeah, I think that if you think about it more, the curriculum piece, it's the board's purview under your educational quality standards to approve our curricular. I mean, it's your curriculum, right? So, I mean, typically, that's where, that's where this entity fits into that discussion, I think. It's, it's stated very clearly in the educational policy, or educational quality standards. So the curriculum, the board approves. curriculum itself should speak to field trips and equity. No, the, no. The, the, what the board's purview would be under EQS is to approve the district's curriculum. Right. So something like a field trip is would have to have a tied connection to what you've approved the fourth grade curriculum to be based on the standards that are guiding that work. Great. But then, like, you can connect it very easily that way. So how does that come up for discussion? I don't know. Good question. Okay, we could think about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but they're two different things, right? Right. Two different things. Okay. And I'm fine. I just don't. <laughs> one is a little bit over there. One is a little bit over there. One is a little bit over there. There are all of our field trips. And right. Yeah. We should create an action item so that this doesn't just linger out there for the next several months. Are uh, the field trips or what are our field trips trying to And actually, that was the data that somebody else said they would help us with. Yeah. And I think it works I don't think that's what she was saying. She was, yeah, talking, about fundraise for she was talking about fundraising data. Right. Oh, and you're just saying, yeah. since there are no field trips in our budget, as far as I know, right now, Everything they fundraise for would be. I think there is a line yeah, right? in our budget for the school budget. Yeah, thank you. So, so we need to know where all of our field trips, what are we paying for right now, what are we not paying for right now? Yeah, 
responses so we can year's budget. We're still working on the curriculum, right? So this could be a longer term question, I think. If, especially if we want we to start do it well and not just throw people into mayhem. Or not just say we're going to fund Montreal and Boston because that's what the trips have always been. Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, do, if teachers are out, teachers I'm sure are out to putting pieces in place for this year's Boston and Montreal trips. So let's, let's yeah. work on this yeah. question yeah. with an eye to next year. Yeah. 